Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about God's Warriors Part 2. You're going to love this. Last week we looked at a powerful message from uh, Psalm 60 verse 7 in the NLT. It says that Ephraim is my helmet producing my warriors. And it says that Judah is my scepter producing my kings. Today I want to talk a little bit about that and get into that, what it looks like to be a warrior and a king. So let me just go Ephraim. Ephraim means to be fruitful in a foreign land, to be fruitful in a foreign land. I shared the story about when Pastor Leanne and I moved over here with our little boys. I remember there was a man in the church saying, how cruel, how cruel, how could they do that? How could they send this beautiful young family to a foreign land when nobody knows them? It, it, it's cruel. This, this church planning thing is cruel. But you know what? We knew we were going with God. We knew we were going by the will of God. We got three confirmations from the most random sources that we knew that God was sending us to San Diego. But I've got to tell you, there was there was no, no reception when we landed here. There was no one to pick us up from the airport. In fact, in fact, the house that we were renting had fallen through. It was a little bit devastating. I, I remember sending through the, the deposit on a home we we're going to live in Rancho Bernardo for a year. And uh, because I went off staff, I had to hand my laptop back. Well, the last thing I did was sent the deposit. Well, for three days, we were staying with Leanne's mum and dad. And back then, they didn't have any internet. So I just thought, well, you know, it's a good break. It's a good break not to have any internet. Uh, I'll be off the internet. It'll be fun. But when we, when we got to the airport, all of a sudden, there was uh, one of those internet cafes. And I thought, I'll just check my email. And I saw I had a whole bunch in my inbox. One of them was from the gentleman who I'd sent the money to, wired it, deposit, we're going to rent your house. He said, hey, I just had somebody offer to stay in my house two years. Do you want to do two years because um, you've only offered a year and I really want a two-year deal, not a one-year deal. Second email, hey, I haven't heard back. Uh, if I don't hear back, I'll be going with this other deal. Let me know if you want it for two years. And then the third one was, I just refunded you your money. We're at the airport about to fly out. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And I look, I thought, I better tell Leanne, but she's crying because she's hugging her mum and dad and all the friends and family. I thought, well, I don't want to tell her now. You know what I'll do? I'll wait till we get on the plane. When we're on the plane, when we're seated and, you know, she's wiped the tears and, you know, then, then I'll tell her. Well, we get on the plane and uh, she sits down and, and, you know, the little screen's in the back of the seat. She puts on a movie. And I'm like, well, she's, you know, she's, I don't want to interrupt the movie. I'll wait till she's finished the movie. Well, the movie finishes and then she falls asleep. And I'm like, well, I don't want to wake her. I'll, I'll wait till she wakes up. She wakes up as we're landing. I'm like, well, I'll wait till we get the bags. Then we're trying to find the bags and it's chaos and she's trying to run around and our kids are running around everywhere, you know, what kids are like, all rambunctious. I thought, well, I can't tell her now because she's distracted. I'll wait till we're, so we get in the car and she's like, so what's this house like where we're staying? Funny you should ask. And uh, so it was, it, was an, it was an interesting time. It was an interesting experience. But, but I had to put on the helmet. I had to put on the helmet that I believed that God was going to cause us to be fruitful in a strange land. One of the greatest things that you can understand is that God has chosen, God has highlighted here that Ephraim is my helmet producing my warriors. If you don't believe that God has the best for you, if you don't believe that God wants you to flourish, if you don't believe that God wants you to succeed, you will settle for mediocrity. You will not only settle for mediocrity, but you will step back from the battle. When the devil came and he says, I'm taking your firstborn son, that's the price you have to pay to win the city. I had to put on the helmet of Ephraim I had to put on the helmet that, no, no, God is going to cause me to be fruitful, fruitful, fruitful. Fruitful means expanding. Fruitful means increasing. Fruitful means more and more and more. This is not part of the more and more and more. So I was able to now engage in battle and shebre de rica tiarama and begin to push back on the devil, push back on his lies. If you don't clothe, if you don't believe, that's why it's the helmet because God is saying if you want to advance, if you want to flourish, you've got to believe that I, the Lord, 
your God am with you and with you to prosper you, to cause you to flourish, to cause you to increase. If you don't clothe yourself with that mindset, when the enemy comes in like a flood, you will retreat and step back and you will settle for mediocrity. You will, set, you will let the devil draw the lines of, of your boundaries. I've made a decision. The devil is not going to draw the lines of my boundary. David said, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. God has done this. Let God set the lines. But I found that God will give you whatever you believe him for. God will give you whatever you believe him for. Twelve spies walked into the Jordan. They go over into the promised land. They see the promised land. It was a land called the promised land because it had been a promise that went all the way back to Abraham, then all the way back to Isaac, all the way back to Jacob. This was a promise that had been in play for 500 years. Now these men, these were the generation, this was the lineage, this was the seed, this was the offspring of Abraham standing in the promise, surveying the promise. But 10 spies refused to believe. Ten spies looked and said, it is difficult. It is too difficult. The cities are fortified. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. The people are numerous. Moreover, the Anakim, giants are in the land. We were like grasshoppers in our side, grasshoppers in their side. We are not able to take it. But two, Joshua and Caleb said, what are you talking about? Their protection has departed from them. They are our bread. They are our food. See, what you believe determines what you will see. What you believe, if you believe that it's hopeless, if you believe that you can't buy a home in San Diego, if you believe that you're going to fail, if you believe that because the economy's crashed, God is no longer able to provide, if you believe that, well, I lost my job, therefore I'm not going, if you, be, whatever you believe determines what you see. I made a decision that I will preach the Word of God in season and out of season. I will preach the Word of God in plenty and in famine. I will preach the Word of God because I know if I preach the Word of God, I can make you, I can switch on your believing mechanism because I want you to believe the promises of God because whatever you believe determines what you see. That's why the devil, the devil knows you are wired by God to believe. So he will infect, he will infiltrate, he, he will saturate your mind, your soul, your spirit constantly with negativity. He will saturate you on all the airwaves and all the media waves. He will constantly saturate you with fear, with anxiety, with hopelessness, with doubt. Like, man, can you even believe, man, are we even going to make it? What's the new normal going to be? He will try and overwhelm your senses because he knows how God made you. God made you to see what you believe. God brings Abraham out. Abraham is, is 90. His wife is 80. And God shows him, he says, get out of your tent and look up and count the stars if you're able. Because more will your descendants be than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. The Bible says in Romans 4 that contrary to hope, in hope Abraham believed God because he counted God faithful who had promised. He knew that God is not a man that he should lie. So Abraham, for the next decade, gets his believer going. He just believes God. People thought he was crazy, but nine years later, at 99, God visits him and says, it's time, it's time, change your name. Your name Abram means exalted father. I want you to now change your name to Abraham, father of multitudes. So Abraham's in the marketplace and, hey, Abram, oh, excuse me. It's not Abram anymore. Call me Abraham, father of multitudes. They're like, you're 99. Your wife is 89. How many babies has she had? Zero. Nix, nada, zippity doodah, nothing. They're going home. You're not going to believe who I saw today. I saw Abram. He's changed his name. What's he changed it to? No children. No, no, he's changed it to father of a multitude. He's been drinking, hasn't he? And... No, nobody, nobody, but you know, Abraham didn't need their approval. Abraham didn't need their amen. The great danger of Instagram, the great danger of Facebook, the great danger of social media is too often we are looking to that for an amen of what God spoke. No, no, you are God's amen. 
God is looking for an amen. The reason He made man with a mouth is so that you can amen His promise. The reason God gave man a mouth is so that you can amen His word. If you can come into alignment with God, Abraham goes out and God says, count the stars if you are able. The Bible says, Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed. Watch this. Because he believed, he saw his wife at 90 years of age bring forth Isaac. They bring forth a baby they name Laughter. Laughter. Because there was no other name that they could think of that was befitting of this. For years, people laughed us. For years, people mocked us. For years, people scorned us. For years, people called us foolish. But he who laughs last, laughs best. And so they said, yeah, you know what? His name Yitzhak means laughter because we're laughing all the way to the bank, people. We're laughing all that this is the goodness of God. This is the promise of God. You know, what's interesting is Abraham didn't have a Bible. Abraham didn't have a Bible. He may have just been hearing voices in the wilderness. In fact, let me say that he was hearing voices in the wilderness. There were many gods who were the God of the Amorites. There were the God of the Canaanites. There were the gods of the Chaldeans. Don't, don't think there were no other gods. There were lots of gods. But Abraham found that the other gods were capricious. And he kept finding himself this God, yud heh vav -Hey, this God kept coming to him, kept making promises to him, kept showing kindness to him, kept ministering to him, kept leading him kept instructing him in the midst of his hopelessness, in the midst of overwhelmed, this God comes and visits him and he believes what he heard. Is he insane? Is he mad? But because of what he believes, he sees. Now Isaac becomes the embodiment of that promise. Isaac becomes a living epistle. Isaac is now the Tanakh, the Torah. He's now a written word of God because he only exists because Papa Abraham believed. So Isaac brings forth Jacob and Esau. They grow up knowing the story of how Isaac was conceived. They know the story of Abraham and Sarai from uh, Abraham, Sarah. They, they know the story and now they carry the promise of God. They carry a devotion. That's our God, the God that does the miraculous, the God that governs, the God that promises, the God that protects, the God that provides. That's our God and the entire nation of Israel's form. You have to put on the helmet. That helmet will produce warriors. If you believe that life is gonna kick you around, if you believe that, you know what, God is not for you, that God doesn't want you to flourish. If you believe that, you know, hey, it just it depends on the economy. It just depends on, you know what, I love tithing in good times and I love tithing in struggle times because I'm determined I'm going to put on that helmet that I'm believing that whether the, whether it's fat years or whether it's lean years I'm going to God is still my provider God is still going to be faithful I'm going to have a testimony when everybody else stepped back in fear we bought buildings we took ground we took I mean who would have thought in 2020 2020 in a year of a downturn they would have you know 160 acres in play down there you know in Campo that would host our first our, our vision builders this year. Who would have thought that we'd be, you know, in construction on an East County building out there in El Cajun? Who would have thought that we'd have a $25 million building, you know, about to open up in San Marcos? And then who would have thought that we'd also just, God just said, hey, you know what, that's, if you think that's good, let me do this. Let me throw in a 12 to $14 million building in Salt Lake City as well. I mean, if you would have told me that, I would have said, you are crazy. Whatever you're smoking, give me a little. No, I wouldn't have said that. I would not, I would not have said that. I would not have said that, but I would have been tempted, but I wouldn't have said that. Whatever you believe, whatever you believe, believe that you can be fruitful in a foreign, foreign land. Believe that you can be fruitful in a foreign land. You've got to put on that salvation. Because if, if, you, if you don't believe that God wants to bless you, that's why I get so disturbed with the people who are anti-prosperity. You're just preaching the prosperity doctrine. You and Joel Osteen with your prosperity, blab it and grab it, confess it and possess it. Nowhere in the Bible do I find that God is anti-prosperity. Nowhere. 
Nowhere. Now listen, absolutely does he say, hey, don't worship mammon. Duh. But you've got to have it in order to be tempted to worship it. He said, God wants you to flourish. You know, the word in the Bible for poor means to have insufficient to meet your needs. To, to have insufficiency to meet your needs. In other words, you can't meet your needs. That's poverty. The Bible word for rich isn't uh, that you have a Rolex and a yacht. The word rich in the Hebrew in the scriptures is to have more than enough to meet not only your needs, but also the needs of others. Which one do you think God wants to position you for you to be the people of God and you can never make it? You always got to beg from the bank and beg from the landlord and beg for it because you have insufficient or that you're the, the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath, that you will lend to many and borrow from none. Come on, somebody. That you are rich, you are blessed, that you've got enough to meet all of your needs and abundance, surplus, where you're able to help other people meet their needs. And when they say, man, how are you able to do that? You can say, because the Lord is my God. He blesses me. My helmet is Ephraim. I am fruitful in a foreign land. The foreign land thing is, is really interesting because the, 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 the goal of every leader is to have vision. Vision is a picture of a tomorrow you have not yet experienced. Vision is a picture of a tomorrow you have not yet experienced. When we came to San Diego, I was happy to have one church in one location. And God says, here's the, here's the blueprint. Here's the vision. One church, four locations. And I'm like, I can't. God, I'm just, why can't you just, why can't you just let me have one church in one location? Why the, the and, but I knew that God was putting a picture in the future. When we got, started getting to that, I'm like, oh, dear God, am I going to get hit by a bus or raptured or, you know, what's going to happen? Because, you know, we're about to start our, I'm like, let's delay our fourth campus. And, and, uh, and God says, no, no, no. Uh, I was with Pastor John Heinrich, 16 campuses. I'm like, thank God. Okay, so you still got. And so, so now it's 16 campuses. And I remember walking up the hill and I was saying to John, oh, this is a bit weird. But as I walked down, I had it in my spirit. So God will always give you a picture in front of you. But the picture in front of you is where you haven't been. Now they say that leadership is leading. You can't lead someone where you've never been yourself. Well, that's my entire testimony. I've never been here. I just got a picture from God. This is where we're going. Vision is God who lives outside of time going into your future chink, chink, and giving you a postcard. You know how we send a postcard? Hey, it's wonderful here in the Bahamas. You know, I always get postcards from uh, John and Becky when they're in Cancun. And they never say, wish you were here. <laughs> I don't know why that is. <laughs> I never get them. But, um, but God does, instead of you sending a picture from, God sends a picture from your future. Wish you were here. Can't wait to see you here. This is where you're going. This is where you're, when you see that, you know what it does is it produces a warrior in you. Once you see that, you now, sure, brother, you, Ephraim will produce the, you've got to believe, you've got to see. I've labored on that. Is it, did you got, catch that? The last one in the last couple of minutes, dear Jesus, I'm so naughty. The last one is Judah. Judah, my scepter, will produce my kings. The name Judah means praise. The name Judah means praise. Wherever you see Judah, just, just uh, interchange it with the word praise. And praise my scepter. A scepter is, is a thing a king holds that represents his authority. If you want to see the authority of God flow in your life, it is unlocked through praise. You didn't catch that. If you want to see the authority of God flow through your life, it is not unlocked with whining. It is not unlocked with complaining. It is not unlocked with crying. It is unlocked with praise. When we lived in New Zealand, that was the, the, the lesson where God said to me, uh, go down to Waddle Downs and praise me for the house that I have given you. And I said to God, Leanne was eight months pregnant. I said, you know what? I'd love to do that. <laughs> I'd love to. Un poquito problema. You haven't given us a freaking house to praise you for. And God says, just because you don't see it doesn't mean I haven't given it. God said, I have released it from the heavens, but it has not yet materialized in the earth. And you need to do a final push. I've released it from heaven. My promises come from heaven.
but to manifest it on earth, for you to give birth to it on earth, I need you to go and praise me. Praise, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. God's power is released through praise. Jehoshaphat in a battle where they were so outnumbered, so outnumbered, like a thousand to one outnumbered. He was overwhelmed and God says to him, because you cried out to me, you won't even need to fight in this battle. He says, you put the musicians and the singers first. Now I can understand that if they were singing out of tune or if they were just continually fighting and complaining. Let's kill them off. But no, he's like, put the musicians and the singers out in front and get them to bring. And the Bible says, as they began to praise the Lord, God came down with such a thunder amongst the enemies that the enemies turned on one another and began to fight, infight amongst themselves in a spirit of confusion. And they killed one another so that the Israelites, when they got there, they're like, I think he's still alive. Oh, no, he's dead. Killed one. Well, not really. He was already dead. They didn't even have to fight in the battle. Praises set ambushes. When, when, you, when you praise God, you release something from heaven. Praise, Judah is my scepter. If you want to know what it's like to carry authority, begin to praise. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to steal your praise. Why do you think that our governor said there's no singing in church? Because the devil knows the scriptures better than most Christians. He knows that a, ch a muted church is a church where there's no power. But he knows that a praising church, a church that says, you know what, King, you can heat the furnace seven times hotter. We ain't bowing to your idols. We ain't bowing to your culture. We ain't bowing to your music. You can play all the music you like. We will worship and we will praise the one true God and you ain't going to silence us. And then there was another in the fire standing next to me. They found the God who stood with them in the fire in the fire. Praise is a scepter producing my kings. What is a king? A king is someone who rules over a territory. If you want to rule over your territory, it begins with praise. If you want to rule over a territory, it begins with praise. Wherever you praise, this is what I found that quite often demons manifest when praise happens. In the middle of praise, when you begin to praise, sometimes we, when we were first learning to cast out demons, you know, we'd get where this demon, no, wouldn't come out. I'm like, oh dear God, what are you Nowhere in the Bible does it say what to do when they say no. They always just would come out. I'm like, what do we do? And the Holy Spirit said, just start praising. I'm like, Holy Spirit, please. We're trying to uh, read the scriptures and find out. Uh, and he's like, just start praising. I'm like, Holy Spirit, I'll praise once they're gone. Please stop interrupting. And he's like, no, no, no. No, you just. And so as we would start praising, they would hold their ears and scream, stop it. And then they'd finally leave. Because I realized that praising was because God inhabits the praise. As your praise goes up, the kingdom comes down. The greatest thing you can do is, is, is begin to praise God for your territory. Praise God around your home. Praise God over your children. Praise God over your life. Praise God over your future. Wherever your praise goes up, it, a scepter comes into your hand and it produces kings. It produces authority. You will rule and govern over what you praise. Whatever you praise, God will put you in authority over. That's why the enemy will try and get you to whine. He'll try and get you to complain. He'll try and get you to be a naysayer, a, a negative Nancy. Well, it's so difficult to own a home. And so, but begin to praise God that we're going to have a beautiful home home in San Diego. Begin to praise God that we're the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. We're going to flourish. We're going to flourish in this. Begin to praise God that God has got everything. Right. Instead of spending all that time complaining and whining, instead, why don't you switch it? Why don't you understand that Judah is my scepter? If, if God said, hey, do you want to hold this scepter? Whoever holds this scepter is king. For that moment, I flip, yeah, man, you know what I wish for? This is better than a genie in a boat. Whoever holds that scepter, that scepter God has given you is called praise. Just begin to praise God. I praise you, Father, that every one of my children are serving God. I praise you that you're raising up leaders. I praise you that you're opening the city. I praise you that we're going to have 16 campuses. I praise you that we're going to see healings, miracles, signs. I praise you that the greatest miracles that we've yet to see are in front of us and not behind us. I praise you that people are going to come in in a wheelchair and then wheel that wheelchair out, pushing it out with legs. Walk. I praise you that deaf ears are going to open. I praise you the blind eyes 
eyes are going to open. I praise you that people are going to come in with terminal illnesses and terminal will be terminated. I praise you who are going to come in barren, but they're going to leave fruitful. I praise you as we begin to praise. Do not let the enemy steal your praise. If he can take away your praise, he can take away your power. But it's the praise, it's the Judah that is the scepter of God producing my kings. You were created to be a king. You were created to govern. You were created, you were the sons and daughters of the Most High God, which means that if God is the king of kings, you have to be a king. If he were to be a king of kings, he's not a king of paupers. He's not a king of peasants. He's a king of kings. If you're a son or a daughter of the king that makes you a, a prince or a princess, you immediately, just by air, just by rights, have a destiny where you will rule and reign over an empire, rule and reign over a kingdom. Clothe yourself with Ephraim. I am blessed to increase, to flourish. I'm caused to rule and reign over a territory. And the way that I do that is with the scepter of praise. Do not let the devil steal your praise. Now listen, don't praise when good things happen. Praise before they happen. Praise precedes breakthrough. It never follows it. They marched around Jericho while it was yet impregnable, while it was yet impossible, before any cracks, before any, spl any splits in the, in, the, in the stone. There was no fractures. There was no compromise. It was fortified compound, and yet they began to praise, and the walls came down. The praise came first. The walls came down following. Praise God. Begin to praise God. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet as we come to an end? If you're watching online, God has got a great plan. He's got a great purpose. He wants you to be fruitful, but you'll see what you believe. But can I just encourage you, begin to praise God. Begin to praise God, and God will change everything. Everything will shift in your life. Go to awakenchurch.com forward slash Jesus. Awakenchurch.com forward slash Jesus. Start following Christ. It is the greatest life, I promise you. I've been doing this for 35 years. There is no life like following Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, Lord, with our hands lifted, with our hands lifted, just, just make a, a fresh declaration. See, your mouth, the devil would love to put complaining in your mouth. He'd love for you to put, he'd love to, your mouth to be filled with whining. Why doesn't this happen? Why doesn't, why doesn't, why doesn't? Abraham was like that. God, look, you have not given me a son. You have not given me an, so God says, all right, get out of your tent. Look up and count the stars if you are able. Because me looking at what you don't have, responding to your complaint will not bring breakthrough. I need you to, to look at the promises of God and begin to praise me for what I am about to deliver to you. And as Abraham shifted from whining into praise, the God of miracles broke through. Just begin to praise God. Just begin to praise God. Whatever you're believing for, praise Him like you've already got it. Praise Him like it's already yours. Praise Him. If you're believing God for a home, praise Him for that home. If you're believing God for a baby, praise Him for that baby. If you've got a son or a daughter who's away from God, praise Him like they've already come back. Whatever you're believing God for. Come on, let's just take 10 seconds. Father, we just bless you. We praise you. We praise you for what you're doing in Hope Village Church up in Seattle. We praise you that every, every dollar they need comes in. We praise you for buildings. We praise you for buildings. We praise you for leaders. We praise you for an incredible launch team. We praise you for great warriors. We praise you for great friends. We praise you for great schools. We praise you for great provision. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that every one of our campuses flourish. We praise you, Lord God, that you are going to silence the, the wolves. You're going to silence the mouths of lions that want to accuse us as Daniel because of our prayers and our devotion to God. They want to throw us into a pit and have us consumed by lions. But we praise you that you send angels to shut the mouths of lions. And the very ones that try to throw us in will be destroyed by the very edifice that they tried to rail against us. We declare right now, right now, right now, the voice of the church, the church is breaking out. We thank you for this nation. We thank you that America will once again return to peace. It'll once return to prosperity. We declare the new normal is not set by the wicked. Right now we declare and we praise you, Lord God, that the wicked 
the wicked will not have the scepter. The, 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 the scepter of the wicked will not rest on this land. It will not rest on this land. We thank you right now for godly men and godly women rising up in this hour, occupying seats of authority that American America can again be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all, that our justice system is restored. Our justice, instead of Supreme Court stacked with the wicked judges, we have righteous judges, righteous judges replacing the wicked judges. The righteousness would reign across our land. Father, bless all of these people today. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen.